I want to begin by adding my welcome to those that, uh, that, that came before and to start us off by saying that those of you who are regulars at this conference, and we love regulars uh, as well as new people, know that traditionally we have come to start the conference after the keynote with a panel that we call the State of Play. State of Play on U.S. politics and immigration policy. We're doing that again this year, of course. But I have to confess that when we start planning, when we started planning this conference, which always begins sometime in the spring, among us, uh, the three organizations, we kind of wondered, what do we really have to talk about this year? This we got a stretch to put a state of play panel together. <laughs> well. What a difference a Trump candidacy <laughs> and changes in House leadership uh, bring about. We have plenty to talk about. And so I'm particularly glad uh, for the panel that we have today, the people that are sitting at this table, because um, they bring uh, uh, some critical perspectives and experiences. And I think we're going to have a very uh, a good discussion. As you know, we try to make this be as conversational as possible. And so we will get to know each other in the next hour and a quarter. Uh, I'm Doris Meissner, Senior Fellow at the Migration Policy Institute and your moderator. I'm joined by, to my far left, Matt Barreto, who is the co-founder and managing partner of Latino Decisions. Uh, uh, directly uh, next to me, Cesar Gonzalez, who's the Chief of Staff uh, from Representative Mario diaz Bilart's office, and uh, uh, Fawn Johnson, who we welcome back to this stage, but now in a different position as Chief Policy Editor of the Morning Consult. Um, Matt and Fawn are free agents here. Cesar, of course, working on the Hill, is not so much a free agent. So in his case, his views are his own uh, and do not represent Represent that of his uh, principal or of the office of Congressman Diaz Balart. I am going to start with an opening question for each, and then we'll uh, move into crosstalk and uh, uh, follow up questions, and we'll try to leave enough time for you all to ask questions from the audience. So make your notes as you go for 15 or 20 minutes at the end of the session. Overall, we're going to be trying to cover three themes here. First, following on the Secretary's comments this morning, issues that surround DACA DAPA and the executive action of last year. Uh, the congressional landscape where immigration is concerned and immigration action. And of course, the role that immigration has so early begun to play in the presidential campaigns uh, leading up to the election next year. We're going to begin with Matt, who will be in a little bit of a different place where presentation is concerned than the other two because he's a numbers guy and polling people need to have slides and we need to be able to see slides in order to understand the concepts. So Matt is going to begin with a bit of an opening presentation and he's going to cover and I'm asked, I've asked him to cover the executive action uh, polling from last year, negative and positive reactions, uh, as well as the issue that we hear about so much, Latino voting and the many uh, representatives of the Latino community who argue that Latinos could be the decisive factor in the 2016 election. Is that true? What does the polling really show? And and can you see anything this early on about the Trump factor? Mm -hmm. So Matt, please go ahead. Sure. All right, thank you, Doris, uh, for the uh, opportunity to be here and share some of our research and work that we're doing. Um, as Doris said, I'm just going to try to provide a, a short overview so that we can get back to the panel discussion and uh, discuss these very important issues. It's really an honor to be here uh, with you today. Thanks to uh, Clinic and MPI in Georgetown for, uh, for hosting us. So let me just start by uh, assessing the impact of DACA and DAPA. And before uh, DACA and DAPA, I want to start uh, before what l the mood of the Latino electorate looked like just in a few weeks before uh, DACA was announced in 2012. So let's start with the first um, executive action. And back in June of 2012, Latino enthusiasm was low. Um, you heard the secretary speaking about the deportations that had been happening up to that point. There were about 1.2 million 
uh, deportations through June 2012. Uh, and we found when we asked uh, Latino voters their opinion of Obama on immigration policy that he had a net negative of 19. Uh, he was underwater by 19 points in terms of his handling of immigration as a direct result of the deportations. There had been a lot of uh, frustration and push within the community to try to get something done about that. However, he was able to turn that around just within weeks uh, in June of 2012, I believe it was on June 15th. And we saw that continue. We saw that trend continue through election day of 2012 when he turned that negative 19, negative 19 into a plus 52. On election day, we found um, 58% of Latino voters responded that Obama's deferred action policy made them feel more enthusiastic about Obama. Only six percent of Latinos said that it made them feel less enthusiastic. So it was, a, it was a huge net positive for the president. And in the 2012 election, it was really a driving factor in the enthusiasm. Uh, that's not to say it was the only issue or the most important issue, but it was a driving factor in the enthusiasm that brought people to the polls. And that resulted in that very, very high support uh, for President Obama in 2012 election. Not only that, but as we moved into 2014 and we had a new discussion about additional executive actions, uh, we saw that the DACA boost remained, and it remained very strong into the 2014 cycle. Uh, as many as 77% of Latinos in 2014 said that the DACA announcement by the president made them feel more favorable towards the Democrats. By this time, as we were approaching the 2014 midterm, it became obvious uh, that immigration reform in the United States Congress was not going to happen. We had a bill in the Senate. Uh, we did not have a bill in the House uh, that was moving forward. And so immigration reform continued to dominate the discussion, as did executive orders. Uh, and that DACA remained very strong. It was not a short-lived um, uh, boost that the president received from Latinos. It really remained strong. Well, of course, no, nothing happened before the election, but in the immediate aftermath of the election, as soon as the election was over, uh, the president issued additional executive orders. And we asked people uh, about a couple of weeks after these executive orders in November of 2014 whether or not they opposed or supported uh, these additional uh, executive orders, which not only clarified and extended the DACA for childhood arrivals, but also, as you heard the Secretary explain this morning, extended those provisions to parents who met certain conditions. And we saw overwhelming uh, support in that poll that we conducted. 68% uh, of Latinos strongly supported the President's action, another 21% somewhat supporting. And so overall, we had 89% of Latino voters who thought that was a good idea. And we found that this was true across the ideological spectrum. Um, at its height, DACA, we found when we went back and looked at our polling there that it had 84% approvals. So this was about five points higher even than DACA had in extending those provisions to parents with 89% with support. Um, really, the most unifying piece of policy that we had encountered, we've been polling on a lot of issues, not just immigration issues, um, virtually all policy issues, really the most unified we'd seen Latino public opinion. There was a real sense in the community that something needed to be done, not just for the childhood rivals, but for parents. And as I just mentioned, we saw that this was not just strong, of course, with such high support, it wouldn't be driven by just one group, uh, but across the board, including of Latino Republicans. Uh, and it's no wonder, bringing the conversation to uh, the full circle that Doris just mentioned, it's no wonder that just a few days ago, um, Latino conservatives led by Alfonso Aguilar and others went and protested the candidacy of Donald Trump and called on him to clarify his rhetoric and his policy position towards uh, Latinos and towards immigrants. We found this in November of 2014 with over 70% of Latino Republicans saying, yes, this deferred action makes sense in, in light of the fact that we have no actual uh, legislation moving. Um, it, it, we agree that the, the president should take these actions to protect not only ch uh, childhood arrivals, but also parents. Almost immediately, Republican uh, lawmakers indicated that they might take steps to try to roll back, repeal, or block. Ultimately, we know that they chose the legal framework and that this uh, executive order is held up in the Fifth Circuit. Um, over 80% of Latinos said that they would oppose such efforts. Uh, makes sense. Not only did they support, but they would oppose efforts to roll that back. And again, we found that support was consistent, including over 60% of Latino Republicans saying that they would oppose Republican efforts to try to undo the DACA and the DAPA. One of the main reasons 
that we have found such strong support is not just because it's a feel-good issue and Latinos say, well, there are a lot of immigrants and we should help those in our community. Uh, but we ask people if they know any undocumented immigrants. And there's a very, very strong personal connection. This idea that there are two Latino communities, that there are undocumented immigrants, and then there are Latino voters that politicians can appeal to on other issues is complete nonsense. 64% of Latino voters in our sample said that they personally know an undocumented immigrant. Among those... Among those 64%, 51% said it's someone in their family, the highest percentage being saying that the undocumented immigrant is one of their parents, uh, while 84% say that it is a personal friend. So 51% of 64% um, is roughly a third, 32.6. So about one in three Latino voters in this country are personally related to an undocumented immigrant. And this is the reason why this issue is so important, why it continues to dominate, uh, and why it is so uh, personally held and felt uh, in the Latino community. That's something that I think some politicians are having a trouble uh, reconciling. So let me transition and look towards 2016 here in the last two minutes, and then I'll turn it back over doors for the, the panel discussion. As we look towards 2016, we know there, there are about 11 uh, states that at this early point are being considered general election toss-up states or swing states. Um, and you, know, you can look at different indicators. Some people say there's 14. Some people say there are only eight. Uh, but these states on the map are the ones that we think probably will be deciding the 2016 election. And they have about 135 electoral votes. Well, in four of those 11 states, have over a 10% Latino electorate, and combined they have 49 electoral votes, Nevada, Colorado, New Mexico, and Florida. These states are all states that were carried by George W. Bush in a close-fought election in 2004 with strong support, around 39 to 40% in the Latino community. They were all states that flipped and went to President Obama in 2008 with very strong support and stronger support in 2012. So the Latino electorate we know will be critical in those 49 electoral uh, votes in those states, uh, but there are other states that we're also paying attention to and watching and evaluating the Latino electorate and Latino trends, and states like Ohio and Virginia, which we expect to be razor thin in 2016 and have very large and growing Latino populations. Sometimes they're lost because these are big states uh, and they don't have a Latino population the size of Florida's. Uh, but they have very large Latino populations, well over 100,000 in the case of Virginia, um, closer to 200,000 Latino registered voters. So when you're talking about elections that are oftentimes in these states decided uh, by 10 or 20,000 votes, the, the Latino electorate, even in these non-traditional states, uh, can be quite critical because it's growing at such a fast rate. Finally, let me just conclude uh, with some data on where the candidates, where some of the candidates stand. Um, and. Uh, Senator Rubio in particular, I think, will be the most interesting to see where uh, he stands if he ends up on the ticket. Um, when we've asked people whether or not they would support these candidates, these are not in head-to-heads, I just have them on the same slide. Um, when we asked them whether or not you would consider supporting, uh, so it's just trying to measure the strength of different candidates' possible positions, not against an opponent. Uh, when we explain, and this was uh, done before um, Secretary Clinton uh, came out in strong support of DACA and DAPA, this question. Uh, now since, in, in a speech in Las Vegas in May, uh, she came out saying that she would renew and extend and perhaps even strengthen or expand uh, DACA and DAPA. But when we asked Latino voters if they would support Secretary Clinton, given her support for DACA and DAPA, we found as much as 85% said that they would be likely to supporting her candidacy. Depending on what happens on the Republican side, we think there's a very real chance uh, that if Secretary Clinton gets the nomination, um, given her strong name recognition and profile in the Latino community, that she has a chance to eclipse and perhaps hit 80% of the Latino vote in 2016. On the other side, uh, you have uh, some who have identified uh, Senator Rubio as perhaps the strongest contender for the Latino vote. And certainly he was an important member of the Gang of Eight in passing the uh, Senate bill on comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, since that time, of course, and gearing towards his own run uh, in a primary, he has backed away from his own bill uh, and has now said 
that he's not exactly sure uh, what the pathway to citizenship would look like or if he supports it or if he only supports legal status and has more so been talking about uh, border security first and foremost and in some interpretations border security as the only measure on immigration reform. When we frame Senator Rubio in this capacity we see that he only hits as high as 29 percent support. In other surveys that we conducted in 2013 during the height of the immigration reform bill uh, we were able to find very strong support for Senator Rubio among Latino voters. Uh, however, in his latest sort of uh, incarnation in, in uh, opposing those efforts, we've seen his numbers slip considerably. So I'm just going to leave, uh, leave the discussion there. Um, I'll be happy to take additional questions and, and we'll have that discussion. Uh, but thank you for your time and thank you for letting me sort of open with 10 minutes to set the stage. Thank you. Okay, let's go to the congressional landscape next. Cesar? Um, obviously, the executive action had a very different reception uh, on the Hill among the um, majority than what it is that's been described here for the Latino community. And um, uh, to the point that, you know, almost immediately it was stated that this was such a breach of trust and faith on the part of the president and executive branch authority that the Congress was not going to be able to work with him any further. There could not be immigration legislation. Was that real? Would something actually have passed or could something have happened if the executive action had not taken place? And then if we fast forward and go now, to what's taking place in the, well, taking place as we speak, in terms of the uh, 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 speaker's election, uh, he had to make the commitment to his own caucus that he wouldn't put any immigration legislation before them as a, as a condition for becoming speaker. Can you see any, does that preclude any kind of legislation at all? Is that simply comprehensive reform? Or is there uh, uh, any possibility that the Congress might want to be doing something in some realm of immigration uh, going forward toward the election? Let me take the second question first. Um, actually, brought my own small little prop because I kind of expected that question coming up. Um, for those of you who have followed the day-to-day -day kind of what was going on in Capitol Hill during immigration reform, uh, there's a political reporter, uh, her name is Sung Min Kim, and she followed it pretty cl closely. And recently when uh, Chairman Ryan was, his name was put out as a possible uh, candidate for the speakership, uh, someone asked her on Twitter, hey, do you think that because uh, Chairman Ryan it could be the next speaker and he is well known to have supported uh, you know, fixing our broken immigration system, do you think he would possibly bring up uh, you know, comprehensive or any sort of immigration reform? Uh, and her quote, which goes back to my boss, and, and you know, for those of you that know, he's he worked on this got very, very close to getting something done uh, back in June of uh, 2014. Her response was, my gosh, immigration reform would not have happened the next two years even if we had Speaker Mario diaz Balart. <laughs> <laughs> as much as I hate that that is, I think that is actually unfortunately true. Um, right now where we're at, I think it's going to be very, very difficult. And that goes back to DACA and DAPA and uh, the way that this administration, I think, handled it. Knowing that the that the president was going to do something uh, on executive action was a double-edged sword as we were trying to put together uh, an immigration bill uh, in Congress. Uh, my, my boss, along with uh, uh, Chairman Ryan and other folks in, on the Republican side, were trying to put together a bill. If any of you saw the frontline documentary that came out uh, last week called Immigration Battle, I highly suggest it, even though you have to see my ugly face for about 15, <laughs> 20 minutes. Uh, it tells you the, the, the story of what was going on, and many folks didn't have, had no idea of what was happening. But for us, as we were trying to push, you know, trying to get a bill that would deal with our broken immigration system, one of the things that we faced was a lack of trust in this administration and a lack of trust in previous administrations, be it Republican or Democrat, and any future administration. So the way we tried to go at this issue was to you know, try to take as much of it outside of the administration's hands, because many folks were very concerned that this administration would do something on its own. Um, and we saw that happening, but at the same time, that sort of helped us move the ball along um, and actually kind of gave us a clock that we were working against. And that's why 
uh, up until the day before Mr. Cantor's primary loss, um, we had commitments from a majority of Republicans to move on an immigration bill. It wasn't the Senate bill. It was a bill to deal with uh, border security and, and the folks who are here uh, in undocumented status. Uh, that bill has never been you know, released. I've got it in a locked drawer in my office. It's the only thing that's locked in my office, actually. So hopefully one day it'll see the light of day. Uh, but it, it helped us move, the, move it along. But many folks, as we were talking to them, is like, we do not trust this administration. We don't trust the Bush administration before and how they handled immigration and how they handled our border. So how do we answer that question? How do we deal with that in an immigration reform bill? And that's the answer that we came up with in our bill. And I think that's what led us to get to the point where on June 10th of uh, 2014, we had a, a commitment from a majority of Republicans to move on immigration reform. Uh, and unfortunately, when Mr. Cantor uh, lost his primary on that night, uh, we lost a lot of support because it was seen outside the beltway to many constituents as this is a repudiation of Mr. Cantor's supporting immigration reform. Um, those of us inside the beltway know that it's a little bit more than that, uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But that was the narrative, and, and it quickly you know, evaporated sort of the support that we had uh, for doing something. So, so DOC has had, and DOP have had, you know, like I said, double-edged sword had helped us, and at the same time, it hurt us, but it also got us to the point where we were able to answer some of the questions that really hindered the possibility of moving immigration reform through the Repo Republican conference. Okay, let's uh, go to you, Fawn, and have you talk to us a bit about what your reporting shows. Uh, what, what, from your reporting at that time, you've been watching this all so very closely. What came through to you? What are the takeaways to you about public opinion, how that then affected Congress or not? And is there any connection between that and six months later, the Trump phenomenon bursting into the picture? I, I love the concept of the Trump phenomenon. I, I, I confess that I stole it from you for the lead for the story that we have <laughs> leading our website today. Um, and so let me let me talk about the Trump phenomenon for a second as I see what it is, and then we can um, get onto the public opinion and how this is playing out um, in from my perspective. Uh, I, I, I was watching the debate last night and just marveling in how incredibly good Donald Trump is at reflecting the frustration of the country and making it seem like he can make it all go away with a wave of his hand and um, getting applause for it. He, he, I mean, he, he does this not just on immigration, but on uh, economic issues, on tax reform. Uh, he, he makes it sound like the answers are so simple. Why can't these jokers in the Capitol figure it out? Um, and what I appreciate about that is because his, his, uh, his, his bullhorn is so loud, it is forcing other people to take a look at those questions who might not be able, uh, for the example, Senator Rubio, who has sponsored legislation that would actually provide a path to citizenship, has ha they have to respond to it, and all of a sudden it's in the air again. Um, from I was following the uh, the, the sort of semi-secret meetings that were going on in among the House Republicans in 2014, um, and I have to admit. Um, Sort of shamefacedly, it wasn't until the, I saw the Frontline documentary, which I highly recommend to all of you, um, that I realized that Mario Diaz Balart was not, in fact, lying to us when he said that they were close. Um, me and Sun <laughs> Min and a, num a number of the other reporters who were covering immigration gave up on him. We gave up on the, and, and, and if, if it wasn't just us, I mean, our editors were just, you know, they were like, go cover something else. <laughs> so, um, it, I mean, it really did disappear under the radar. Um, before it probably should have, um, now that I know, uh, but I didn't know at the time. So, um, and, and it has been under the radar, I think, for a reason. Um, my sense from, I spend a lot of time with House Republicans. Uh, I, I, I know some of them pretty well, and they really don't want to talk about immigration. Um, and as I think I've said here before, it does nothing but bring them grief. There is nothing that they can say that won't make somebody angry. And um, they are 
I think many of them, with the exception of a few, you know, are kind of, uh, they're of they have mixed feelings about it. Uh, yes, they're frustrated that we have an illegal population, uh, and they would really like to have that not be the case, and they would really like for the government to enforce their laws. Um, and at the same time, you know, they also know that there's this big population of Latinos who are going to decide their future. Um, in the House, that's a little that's a little under the radar screen because they really have to worry about one county. So sometimes that county, it doesn't particularly matter. Uh, so, so I think once once it became clear that even though those of us in the media had declared the uh, Diaz Blart, Luis Gutierrez, Paul Ryan effort dead long before it probably should have been, um, it did kind of die and go under the radar screen. And Trump has brought it back. Um, he's brought it back by saying outrageous things. And um, my sense is that this will continue at least throughout the primary because this is one of the ways that the Republicans will try and distinguish themselves. They will do so by trying to move as far to the right as possible. Um, and, and the only question is how, how, how much do they strain, how much are they allowed to strain credulity when they do that? Because, it, I mean, Trump is sort of in this, this category where he seems to be able to say whatever he wants and, and people won't call him on it. But p someone like Jeb Bush or, Mar or Marco Rubio, even Ted Cruz, have to be a little bit more careful. So I think that we'll see a lot more in the primary about it. I, um, I think that uh, with Hillary Clinton's fairly strong endorsement of the administrative actions, that could also become a fighting, uh, a fighting topic in the, in the general. Uh, which means that it'll be in the front of, of people's minds. Um, what that does for the next Congress, I'm not entirely sure, uh, except for the fact that some of the conservatives who have been involved, like, like Paul Ryan, Paul Ryan is not a part of the Freedom Caucus, but some of the others, Raul Labrador, um, Mike, M Mick Mulvaney, uh, who have been involved in immigration before are very encouraged that Paul Ryan will be their leader and they want to move forward in what they call a conservative fashion. And so, you know, there's, there might be some possibility to take all this vitriol that is coming out from the Republican primary and turn it into something productive, but it won't happen until after the election. Let me pick up on a couple of those points and, and, and encourage, you know, anybody all to respond. Because this idea that, that Trump puts forward that but for him, immigration wouldn't be in the discussion. And you've underscored that by saying he brought it back and, and um, all of a sudden it's in the air again. Uh, d does that really hold? I mean, there are significant differences on immigration among the Republican candidates setting Trump aside. I mean, you have Rubio, Bush, Lindsey Graham, who have all, and maybe others, but those are the ones that come to mind, who have been, you know, not just have had a position that's different from, say, Ted Cruz, uh, but have been leaders in terms of uh, uh, some efforts at immigration legislation doesn't need to be the Senate bill, but have been you know, committed to the idea that, that, that this needs to happen and needs to happen for the Republican Party as well as for um, the you know, ov overall in terms of the, of the country. Why wouldn't it be part of the campaign in any event? What, what, what do people think? And, and Matt, what do you think yeah. in terms of, you I'll, know, what I'll the numbers I'll start to say show? a few words, and I, I'm sure we all have ideas on this. Um, I mean, certainly immigration reform has, has been a big topic and has been being debated well before uh, Donald Trump entered, entered the campaign. I mean, we were very close to a bill in 06. Uh, we had another attempt in 07. Uh, the DREAM Act passed the House in 2010. And was only a few votes short of passing the Senate and becoming law in 2010. So I think that, you know, people in Washington, D.C. have been at this a while. People have been discussing and debating this for a while. It's not as though Donald Trump invented it. What he did do uh, that I very, very strongly agree uh, with what Fawn said there was he sort of put his perspective very strongly back on the agenda, which was the sort of very strong anti-immigrant uh, perspective that had sort of because of the efforts, I think, um, that Cesar is talking about, it had started to lose favor a little bit. People started to realize we have to do something about the immigration system. And so, you know, there was, there was beliefs, maybe this Congress wasn't going to pass it, but we were moving in that direction. I think what Trump did was really set that entire effort back 
by putting his very strong uh, anti-compromise, anti-immigrant uh, sentiment back on the agenda. But immigration as an issue, as you know well, you guys have been um, researching and talking about it, has been an issue in this country really strongly since that 06 effort. Um, so that's, you know, almost 10 years now. I mean, I always thought that immigration was going to be a part of the conversation. Uh, part of this, one of the things that we did when we were drafting our bill was we pulled it, focused it, focus grouped it uh, with Republican primary voters. And we found that about 12% of the folks were, no matter what you do, no matter how you phrase it, we're never going to get those. But those 12% are primary voters, and they are the ones that always show up. Um, and so no matter what, I think immigration was going to, to show up. It may be a more nuanced conversation between Mr. Cruz and, and, and Governor Bush, uh, but it was always going to come up. You, you look back at the last time uh, we had our primary uh, Governor Romney really didn't have a position on immigration till the till the primary uh, debates, um, and then that was the one time he figured, well, I can go to the right of you know Speaker Gingrich, of uh, Governor Perry, uh, and so he used it to his advantage, and and it helped him a little bit in in, in the primary uh, you know elections at at that time. So I always thought it was going to come up. I I know we had some discussions. Uh, before the, the debates that we were going to see, well, if these debates, depending how they turn out, how how is the vitriol on immigration so bad that we can't look at at a window possibly coming up? It would have been about now. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once the Trump phenomenon popped up, uh, we knew you know this this was not going to happen because he the, you know the way that he's phrased it, uh, you know, and he's and he's he's gotten the frustration of a lot of people who are frustrated with their government. Um, no policy, you know, answers, but he, he expresses the frustration of people with, and I've got those same frustrations sometimes um, in dealing with this issue, uh, not that I'm nowhere near a Trump supporter, uh, <laughs> but, I, but I understand it, and that's, that, that phenomenon that came up just has, has really hurt, you know, the possibility of us looking for a small window, uh, you know, this, this, this fall. And I, I guess in my, um, again, the, I think the media tends to be um, a little less in the weeds on a lot of this stuff, um, which changes the perspective slightly. And the reason why I think that it was under the radar, at least in the, in the sort of editorial worlds that I've been in for the last couple of years, is that the Republican primary candidates and um, many Republican uh, members of the House have been really chasing after the Tea Party and, and, the, and the hard right mm -hmm. kind of populist flank that has um, ushered in this, this uh, very conservative House. And the Tea Party is, um, Im immigration is not their top yeah. issue. They, they are really focused on government spending, the role of government. Uh, they, they're, they're very good at picking uh, their, um, their foes inside their party. So, you know, John Boehner uh, is one of them. Um, sometimes Mitch McConnell, sometimes not. I mean, it, it, it's very interesting to talk to them. It's not that they don't want the same things that Trump is talking about in terms of deporting 11 million people and that this should never have happened and how could it have happened. Um, they do. It's just that that's not what they're focusing on. And so when I'm Are watching, you talking about the members or the voters? I'm talking about the voters. Uh -huh. And so when I'm watching the members try and react to that, and particularly as they're looking for a you know a big presidential you know, they want the country to endorse them to be their candidate um, especially in the primary they're they're catering to the top concerns of the tea party and that's really more about the role of government um, and so you can use immigration as one of the sins of the obama administration because of his executive actions mm -hmm. but it's not the only one and um so it, it's kind of it, immigration in, in the national polls that, that I've looked at, you know, you ask voters what's the most important thing. It, and it's sometimes it's number three, um, sometimes it's lower. It's never the top one unless you're talking to the Latino electorate. Uh, but the thing that I was fascinated with was, was in the last debate, um, not last night's, but the one in September, at morning consult we have a polling operation. And we went into the field right after the debate. and. We gave uh, our respondents something like 10 different 
uh, options of what they thought the most important issue was that was discussed in the debate. So they ranged from things like Planned Parenthood to climate change to um, gun control to the Iraq war. And so, you know, you got the, the range, but 35% of them picked immigration as the most important. I was shocked by this because this is not what I, when I look at public opinion polls, that's not what I normally see. That was the highest by far of any of the issues that they picked. The next, the next one was 20% at um, some people just saying generally the Middle East. So what that told me that something has changed a little bit. And I don't know if it's because of Donald Trump or, or, or that it was just the most fiery part of the debate mm -hmm. around that time. But it is, um, it's a different perspective than what I saw a year ago. Mm -hmm. Can I push back yeah. on that just a tiny bit? I'll say quickly, just in terms of the Tea Party, and, and maybe this is how voters, that's why I was trying to clarify if you're speaking of voters or, or members. Um, and I think this is, you know, how we got where we were in the House, at least, was that, you know, I think that there, there are principles listed on websites and stuff like that that talk about government spending. But when you look at the supporters, the voters, and you look at public opinion of the Tea Party supporters, immigration really is the issue they care about, and government spending is not the issue they care about. What they care about is giving money to people that don't look like them and who don't um, come from where they come from in terms of uh, the history of this country. That's the issue that the Tea Party voters care about. And uh, stopping anything that has the word Obama on it. It has, you know, they have the highest support for Social Security and for Medicare. That's expensive government spending. They have extremely high support for military spending. So I think, and, and, and that I think, you brought up sort of full circle with your own, you know, sort of observations on the polling data of, of I don't know if those were viewers or were primary folks, but I think they have done an extremely effective job of keeping that issue on the table and bothering their members and your colleagues, Cesar, about this issue. They are extremely anxious and frustrated, and that's what Trump is, is tapping into. It's by no stretch a majority of even Republicans. Yeah, and then that's what our polling, when we did, I mean, we did extensive polling on this, on this issue, and you know, like I said, to Republicans and primary voters. The Tea Party is that 12% or so that, yeah. I, that I spoke about. Right. The vast majority of, I think, Republican primary voters, um, when we put forward you know, the description of our bill and some of the, the proposals that were in there, um, I actually almost fell out of my chair the first time our pollster showed it to us because the results were so good. Um, and, you know, but like that 12%, they were adamant, no matter how you phrase it, no matter how you do it. And, and that's, you know, and they're very the, loud, right? I mean, they write letters to your colleagues. I mean, and, our district is, you know, most, no, they, they write letters to our district. And, <laughs> and I'll, you know, our district is uh, more than half foreign born, doesn't include like my generation, first generation here. Uh, and then they're very, very organized, uh, very loud. But that's, it's that 12%. Now, it's, it's very difficult. You know, members do get, you know, afraid because they, they, they're so well organized. You know, they've got their talking points. I mean, they, they, in our district, they're hitting us all the time. I get, I get more, more letters in our district, uh, again, sometimes uh, immigration reform than I do for. And, and we're in Miami. I mean, it's a city, a city that did not exist if it wasn't for immigration. Yeah. Uh, so, so, it's, so it's very difficult for some of these members in, 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 uh, in communities that, that don't have large immigrant populations. But some of them, if you, if you look at that Frontline Art um, documentary, look at what Ms., uh, Mick Mulvaney, who is a, one of the leaders of, of, of the you know, House Freedom Caucus and a, and a real Tea Party guy. And he actually does a town hall meeting in South Carolina, all in Spanish. Him himself. The, the I speech mean, that Mick Mulvaney yeah. gives in this particular mm -hmm. documentary is worth the yeah. entire mm -hmm. the, the entire viewing of it <laughs> and, and, alone. And so there's a there's a bunch of members of you know like Mr. Mulvaney and Mr. Labrador that want to they want to deal with it, but yeah. there are some that that don't, and those are the loud. But they're only I think about twelve percent or so. Caesar, I'm curious. So how when you when you were polling on it, how did you how did you sell it? What was the phrasing that you used to to let people say that it would be okay? Because I've the, the, every time I see somebody come up with a phrase, mm -hmm. there's there is always a you know a, a, a Steve King or a, mm -hmm. you know a Ted Cruz maybe or somebody to just you know. So one of the things that's actually, amnesty. Well, one mm -hmm. of the things we actually did and it was it was a little interesting was uh, our pollster brought in a lot of conservative Republicans to a, a dial testing thing, and they had no idea what 
that part of the dial testing was on our bill. They still to this day do not know that they were <laughs> taking part in that. They were they were just watching through the through the two way glass uh, what these Republican voters were doing. And one of the things that we did was we put up bits and pieces of speeches from my boss, Mr. Gutierrez, Trey Gowdy, Senator Cruz, um, and it was interesting. Uh, Mr. Cruz's uh, statements, Mr. King's statements, really, really low. Now, Mr. Gutierrez's as well were, were, were pretty low, but that's the way he approached it, sort of from an emotion mm -hmm. point of view. Um, but when you put some of the stuff that my boss said, uh, Mr. Gowdy as well, and, and Mr. Mulvaney and a few others, the numbers were, were really high. So we've, we've got, we, we had a wordsmith, we, we worked with it, we changed our build, you know, uh, based on some of the the, the feedback that we were getting, most of it was just wording, like how we how we dealt with this issue, how we spoke about it. Um, I know when my boss first started dealing with this issue, you know, he would he would say certain words, and the first time he met with the pollster, he gave him a list of words: "Do not use these words." <laughs> and so now those are completely gone from his vocabulary. If I remember right? It wasn't require one of the that they we require registration. Yeah. Things like you know, that. Things they're, like they're, that. They're, they're, they're small things like that, that that really pull well within Republican primary voters and got us to the point where we, when we went into talk, you know, my boss literally went in member to member uh, talking to, to them about how our bill was, was put together and what we had in there and, and to try to get their feedback. And, you know, that was, that was, we showed them some of the polling. We did, we did, you know, groups come in of like seven or eight members uh, going over the polling and showing them. Uh, what what we found, and it wasn't just one poll or two polls. I mean, we were going into to strong Republican districts. We were doing dial testing, like I said, um, group you know, group testing. It, you know, we we were very very thorough in this and trying to see how we can get members comfortable and trying to go back to their districts and be able to sell um, a bill. Matt, let me ask you to pick up on uh, this point that you made about the Trump phenomenon, which is to say that. Yes, it would have been in the election debate, but it, the difference is that it's now square back to a strong anti-immigrant tone as compared to immigration generally fighting about amnesty, the kinds of things that were beginning to emerge. How, if, 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 take that forward into the general election and talk a little bit about what you and I talked about mm -hmm. briefly mm -hmm. of what percentage of Latino voting do Republicans need to capture in order to win? How do those... Uh, What's the collision course here? Sure. Well, I, th I think there's there's definitely you know a collision course after the 2012 election. Um, you know, it's quite well known that the GOP issued their uh, you know autopsy report and, and said they need to address this issue, and that really is what inspired uh, the Gang of Eight and the 2013 bill that we had. Um, it's it's you know definitely well known uh, by by you know the strategists and the sort of rubios and and the wit heirs that they have to uh, address this community in the slides that i put up you know when george w bush carried those three states in the southwest and florida uh, in 04 it was when he in a competitive and very competitive election it was when he did well with hispanic voters there that he was able to get those states over the 50.1 mark for him um, and it was through that outreach and um, his policy efforts on immigration certainly were not alienating uh, to Latinos. Uh, now we think that the 40 percent mark is the low point, that it's really between uh, 42 to 47, depending on the state. Uh, the Latino population since 04, uh, now that's 12 years ago now, uh, has gotten much bigger. And so you need more Latino votes in order to swing the state to 50.1, assuming the rest of the state is as divided as it as it was back then. In many of these cases, uh, it still is. So they need to improve those efforts. Um, they need to definitely be into the 40s. And, you know, where were they into 2012 was in the 20s. It was in the 20s. It was really a low, low point. And so I think as you forecast that to 2016, if you think about this collision course, um, there's no doubt in my mind that the rhetoric coming out right now is going to push them much lower than Mitt Romney. There's absolutely no doubt with Hispanic voters. Um, whether or not they can turn that around, are some of the other candidates going to be able to try to offer a different alternative? Um, you know, even as I said, and that's why I had these numbers on Rubio really only topping out at 29, where he has put himself 
in the primary is in a very, very difficult position to sort of resuscitate his support uh, for immigration reform. Uh, and this is something if someone says, no, 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 he's going to be able to do it. Look what happened with John McCain, who was a strong supporter of immigration reform, but did the exact same thing in 08. He went to a border security first. We're not even going to deal with the undocumented issue until we secure the border, secure the border, secure the border. Um, and he was only at about you know, 31, 32, well below what he needed to be. And so I don't think that even a Senator Rubio is going to be able to uh, tack all the way back to the center on this issue. The damage that they're doing to themselves right now, I think, is very real and it's going to be long lasting. Well, I just want to jump in on this, um, in the in the sense that the phenomenon that I, I feel is the most fascinating to watch when it comes to how Republicans are dealing with immigration as an issue is that it's almost like you have to talk very, very tough, and then while you're talking tough. Go talk to Caesar, um, <laughs> and and the you know Mar the reason why Marco Rubio was so important in 2013 with the Gang of Eight was not because he was this you know established deal maker. It was because he was new to the group and he was he had Tea Party credentials, he had conservative credentials, and if he could put his name on something like this, then other people would feel safe to do that. And so I, I will be really fascinated to see. I mean, it's always interesting to watch how candidates tack back towards the center once the primary is over. But but I suspect that the only way that anything actually will happen is if that tough talk uh, continues and then somewhere along the line, lo and behold, Eric Cantor doesn't lose his primary and we have a bill mm. and it's passed, <laughs> boom. Mm. Um, just, it's a, uh, it's just, it, I think it's, I feel very, you know, I feel like Republicans really deserve a lot of credit who have who have tried to deal with this issue because it is so difficult, and the, you can't talk tough enough to make people happy. At the same time, that anybody who sort of digs down, even, you know, scratches the surface a little bit about what the solutions are, you realize that, however, however much you are angry at this population, you can't fix it the way. Yeah. The thing that's you want funny to. though is that you know every poll, and so, so I referenced this, and there's a Fox News poll during 2013 during the Senate bill that if you look at the cross tabs on the Fox News website, you can go and find it. A majority of Republicans in the Fox News poll supported the comprehensive immigrate the bipartisan bill. It wasn't, you know, in the 80s, but it was like 53 percent supported and 36 percent opposed of Republicans. So. What's not clear to me is why, if even a majority support that, why we're letting this 12% or whatever it is dominate this issue force. It's not that hard. Majorities of all people support this effort. It just takes doing something. And I think, you know, uh, for all of the good efforts, it was really sort of the, the dysfunction and, and the frustration, perhaps just with the personalities of Boehner and Obama uh, that, that may have stopped this. But I, I don't. You know, really, as much as I was saying, you know, the Tea Party is dominating this issue, there's still a small percentage and their percentages have shrunk since 2010. Are they still relevant? Exceptionally. But they've shrunk. And I don't know if that's a question for Cesar or what, but why why isn't there, you know, action when we can go and find these these majorities that you found in your own polling that Fox News has found even of Republicans? Um it doesn't seem that hard that if a majority of the American public wants something, <laughs> why we can't <laughs> just throw me under the bus there. You, you, <laughs> you can take that up. Look, I, th I think that twelve percent, like I like I said before, is extremely organized, and yeah. they, and their their microphone is is a lot bigger. And, and in a primary, they they take up sometimes more than the twelve percent. Sure. And depending on the district, in our district, they're probably less than that. Mm -hmm. But in many Republican districts, their their that twelve percent is is ex not exaggerated. It is a bigger part of that primary the primary voter uh and and they 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 because i think they're so organized sometimes they they tend to be able to lead the conversation and say this is what we're talking about um and 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 it's on their terms almost uh which which is difficult for a lot of our members sometimes uh to counteract that you know what's the language that they should i mean you, Look at my boss. He's been doing this for, for, for many, many, many years. And he had to literally sit with a pollster and find out what the language is that he was using that was wrong, that, that, that was, had a negative effect on our ability to move this bill forward because of what he was doing, what he was saying to members, what he was saying at, at town halls, what, we, what he was saying on Fox News. Uh, 
so we you know and, and so we have to do the same thing we have to educate members uh on how to push back and it's it's not that easy and i'll, and I'll be honest members are a little bit better staff uh you know my colleagues uh, god bless them they <laughs> they tend to be a lot more nervous sometimes uh on this issue that's that's what i found that i sometimes found the members were a little bit more out in front than than their staffers were um and again that's that's an educational process that that we we did and that's why literally we went member to member and it was luckily these people were not covering it so much so <laughs> we were able to kind of move around quietly uh and and, and, and that's do that also part of the problem i think in just in the in the discourse the people who are the in the opposition are right there and ready to respond mm -hmm. to any any little thing mm -hmm. that that i mean even the slightest you know if it's a guidance that comes out yeah. of uh of ice you know i i mean and we all know who they are you know i mean you know it's jeff sessions chuck grassley you know they're they're right there they're they're ready to talk and while you guys are you know in the middle of striking deals that you can't talk about you can't even tell us who you're yeah, I, who you're I, dealing I to, with i mean you know I would, I would always get questions about like what are you doing with paul ryan and like i mean they, they constantly ask my boss you know and you know here, here's caesar I, I've never met Paul Ryan. I don't know him. Okay. I've never I've seen him in the hallway once or twice. Okay, now um, I, I, I want to be able to get to leave enough time for audience questions, but I want to move us to one other point and play out the possible scenarios into the general election of what happens with DACA DAPA. There are a couple of different pathways here. Number one, what we're more and more hearing is that the Fifth Circuit is slow walking this and nothing further happens and we're basically in the general election with this issue stuck in the courts unresolved. How does that affect each candidacy? I mean, whoever the candidates are, for the Republican Party, for the Democratic Party, this is an issue that will come up in the general election. How does nothing past where we are now affect the immigration discussion in the general election? Or, in fact, the Fifth Circuit makes this decision, it's a it's a negative decision, uh, very likely. It's appealed, the Supreme Court takes it up, and probably allows the executive branch to go forward because by and large, this is an issue that hasn't been litigated at that to that point. It becomes back to the issue of prosecutorial discretion. And we have a Supreme Court case says that the administration can go forward and probably does start some level of an application process. How that's a very different dynamic that's then taking place in the general election. Play those out. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I think no matter what you've described well, no matter what happens, um, this issue is going to be front and center in 2016. It's going to remain an election issue. It's obviously an election issue in the primary. I mean, you don't really hear a lot of discussion about DACA and DAPA in the Republican primary. You just hear, you know, this sort of vitriolic anti-immigrant rhetoric. Um, so it's already an issue. It's going to remain an issue because um, while the, the Tea Party folks are, are well organized, et cetera, so are the immigration rights folks and the Dreamers and the other groups. And so they will continue to remind all of us that this is unresolved, that we have this executive order, we have this policy uh, that's unresolved. So I expect, you know, uh, everyone from journalists to um, uh, the debate moderators to the candidates will be weighing in on DACA and DAPA specifically um, as that goes forward. You've already heard some, you know, you've heard Secretary Clinton weigh in very strongly. Um, very early on, both uh, Jeb Bush and Marco Rubio sort of took a weird position uh, on those issues. They knew it was, was an issue. So I would say immigration largely, but DACA and DAPA specifically um, will remain front and center. And, and it could be, we could be, if the Fifth Circuit doesn't slow walk it, we could be in June of 16, waiting for the Supreme Court decision on this at the same time that we're watching the presidential conventions uh, in, in July. So. Exactly. That's I think it's going to be a huge issue. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and if that, it, it, I mean, under the second scenario where the administration can actually go forward, uh, you know, I mean, I the response of the Latino community, the Dreamers and the immigration reform activists when DACA started to get rolled out was mm -hmm. amazing to me. I mean, I just... I thought it was, you know, you know that there's this pent-up frustration on their part of 
you know, that people say they haven't done anything wrong and yet there's nothing that can be done for them. And when something finally happened, it was just this outpouring of gratitude. And I think it, it, when it was hugely important to President Obama, uh, if you were able to do that again and, you know, fourfold or fivefold or however much it is, um, right before heading out of office, I, I mean, probably would do him more favors with the electorate than, than anybody else. But it, it would, I think it would just fundamentally change everything um, from the, just the standpoint of you've already got, now you've got a really engaged um, Latino electorate. Mm -hmm. electorate. Mm -hmm. If it stays where it is now, hard to say. Um, you know, the, the Republicans are talking about DAPA, the, the one that's enjoined, as you know, as a huge overstep, and and almost if you if you're not listening carefully, like it's already happened. So I would expect that to continue all the way up until election day. So um, in responding, add this to your uh, uh, to your package. If, under these possible scenarios, as things evolve next spring, can you see any change in the Congress trying to do something in order to? Inoculate? Look, I mean, I think we're always prepared to look for a window. I don't know when that window will ever appear. I mean, hopefully sooner rather than later. Um, I don't know if it's before the election, if it's after the election. Um, you know, I had, like, a, when we were putting together our bill and we were getting so close, um, you know, as Fawn said, most reporters didn't believe what we were saying, even though I was saying it. I think I've said it to some folks in this room, actually. Uh, so there's there's always this opportunity that's there, and we, we need to be prepared uh, to move because something may happen. We never know exactly how some of these things, how people are going to react to, to a decision, um, whether it be by the Fifth Circuit or, or by the Supreme Court. Uh, so I'm never going to say no. Uh, I don't know what that would be. I, I don't know if it's a very small bill, if it's a you know a combination of, of bills, or if it's nothing at all. Uh, I think just you know the the. The community has to be prepared to, to move on, on, on some of these things and see if, if there does appear a window um, that we can go and, and, and work on it. But I'm, I'm very, I feel very down that there's a, there's a chance to do that before that. 10% chance, 8% <laughs> chance, right? Yeah, I mean, 8% I mean, chance for any piece of legislation is actually pretty good. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm hopeful that maybe you know later on uh, we will we'll we'll be we'll have an opportunity. Maybe it is after the election. I mean, if you saw after after the 2012 election, there was this groundswell with, within our party of how do we deal with this issue? We need to answer it. Um, I think the results of of you know depending who the two candidates are, um, you know if we have Trump versus Hillary, you know you know who knows what what that'll bring. But if the election turns out in a certain way. I think some of our members again will be like, "Wait a minute, we need to we need to deal with this with this issue." And this goes back to that frontline documentary. Mulvaney talks about you know the the changing demographics and, and having we need to deal with, with this issue. You know, he, he points out Texas, for example, um, the number of folks and 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 these are numbers actually I gave them, so I take a little credit for this. Uh, the number of, of of U.S. citizens in Texas. I mean who are Hispanic, who haven't registered, you lose Texas uh, on our side of the aisle. And, 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 and no matter how you sweep the rest of that map that was up there, I, I, it, it's very, very hard math uh, to do it at that point. Uh, so I think it's a, you know, we'll see how this turns out, but I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, more likely after the election to see if we can, you know, re-engage. But I'm always ready. <laughs> That's good to hear. Okay, we have microphones, and uh, we are open to questions from the audience. I think we're, I think we're using the we're using the stand-up mics this time. Excuse me. <clears throat> we handed the mics out before because, for security reasons, people were not permitted to move to the aisles. <laughs> that was a new new thing I just learned this morning. <laughs> It's always some new security wrinkle. <laughs> We're expendable up here. No, I'm saying there's, no, there's no threat now. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about being chopped liver. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, over here, Peggy. 
Um, I'm uh, Peggy Ochowski. I'm the Congressional Correspondent for the Hispanic Outlook, and um, I write a lot about immigration for the last few years. So, um, I, I'm surprised you haven't mentioned the battle between comprehensive versus piecemeal. I mean, in 2013, the Republicans had a hearing after, in, in June, after the, the uh, comprehensive bill had passed in the Senate. The House Republicans had a bill called the Kids Act. They wanted to start a process to legalize dreamers. And every one of the Democrats uh, voted against it because they said they don't want something like that piecemeal. It's got to be part of the comprehensive package. So I see sometimes Democrats in their absolute zeal to keep comprehensive, everything comprehensive, they have also blocked the chances to do some piecemeal that lots of Democrats and Republicans agree on. So that, that's one thing I'd like you to mention. The other elephant in the room that I am just really shocked at, but I'm hearing it more and more, including from the guy who changed my water meter yesterday, um, black guy, going to vote for Trump because he is furious about illegal immigration, not only taking jobs, especially in construction and, and low-tech jobs, but also because they are getting away with breaking laws all the time. Now you hear Johnson talk about, we're not going to deport anybody. And, and there's huge movement to give deferred action to people who are not only committing misdemeanors, but felonies. And blacks are noticing. And you, you see some of them being interviewed um, with Trump. Um, and this guy yesterday, we had this long conversation. He finally said, well, you know what? He said, there isn't a day goes by that we don't talk about uh, this with my buddies. And there's a bunch of us saying, you know, we're thinking of voting for Trump. Um, the black vote was double the number. When you talk about numbers, it's double the number of Latinos. It's much more dispersed. If South Carolina gains 5% Latino votes, but they lose 5% black votes. That is double. That's significant. So what about the black population in this? I'll, I'll start with that, and then if, if others want to uh, say sorry, and I just want to talk about the comprehensive versus piecemeal, I'll like, offer a few thoughts. Um, I don't think there's any risk at all of Democrats losing the black vote in 2016. I think there's zero percent risk. <laughs> I mean, anecdotes. He probably lives in D.C., so it doesn't a count. <laughs> Talk about disenfranchisement. I mean, there's definitely, you know, definitely frustration. There's been a lot on this issue. Uh, I think it's generally overblown. The the sort of. Uh, anti-immigrant sentiment in the African-American community. Overwhelming, if you look at Gallup and other trackers, they have almost as high support for comprehensive immigration reform as Latinos. In some polls, they have higher support for comprehensive immigration reform than, than Latinos do. Um, so I, I don't think that that's uh, something that, um, that will be a concern. Certainly, candidates need to work on the turnout dynamic. I think that's a big question heading into 16 as compared to 12 and 8 where the turnout was a little more self-generated. Um, I think turnout is going to be a big issue, but I don't believe there's any risk. Anybody else want to answer to that? You don't have to. You can answer piecemeal. I'll, I'll, I'll take that, the other question. Right. Um, that goes back to what Fawn was saying, you know, what were some of the words you can't use? And one of them was comprehensive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, comprehensive is a dirty word, not just on immigration, yeah, but on, on, on anything, You're, you know, look, we look at it at, at the budget deal that we just passed yesterday, and there was a lot of heartburn on that because it included so many pieces in there uh, with any piece of legislation, you know, Obamacare, anything else that, that's, that's so big, so unruly um, that, that folks are afraid of what, what's in it. Um, but piecemeal could mean a, a vast majority of things. Um, is it, you know, are we taking these things up? In a, in a week, different bills addressing different issues with different coalitions, uh, voting for, for different parts of it. Uh, and, and then it's also how you kind of interlace the issues. Because I, I personally think you, you can't deal with one and then wait you know, six months to deal or a year or two to deal with another. It's, it's, a, you know, it's a Jenga puzzle, and, you, and when, you, when you remove too many pieces, you know, it could all come tumbling down. Uh, but one of the things that we did is how we put together what, what I have always said are the, the two hardest issues to deal with and, and the two biggest for both sides. 
uh, on, on the left, you know, how do you deal with the folks who are here in an undocumented status? And on the right, how do you deal with border security? You, you put those two together in a certain way that we've, we've kind of fashioned, and, and I think that's what helped us move, was we, we came up with a new approach uh, to dealing with that, with that issue that's never been tried before. Uh, it was very different from, from the Senate bill. Uh, even though the Senate bill you know, threw a lot of money in there, it, it, we, we, we felt that that wasn't the, the correct approach to doing that. But if, I think if you, you dealt with those two issues, you marry them together, you force both sides to hold hands and walk down the aisle, uh, together, um, then you can move all the other sort of pieces, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a short matter of time after that, uh, you know, fixing our, you know, visa system, you know, and, and, and things like that. And as we all know, some arranged marriages actually work. That's the point, right? <laughs> Over here. Yeah. Um, well, first I want to correct a misconception, Mr. Barreto said that he, he parroted the slur that people uh, disapprove of immigration before because they don't like people coming in here that don't look like us. That, that's a subtle slur against anybody who legitimately opposes immigration reform, as it's been called. It has nothing to do with race or racism. Uh, he talked about polls of blacks supporting uh, immigration reform. My black friends who are losing their businesses, they're not part of the polls, they're individuals. They're losing their jobs and they are extremely upset about it. Um, <clears throat> I don't, I, the question I pose to you is why it's called reform. We are here in a law school, a prestigious law school, where this quote unquote reform will institutionalize years of breaking our laws, and our laws are the fundamental for this society. Nobody seems to get that or take it seriously. Actually, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you with that because I, I agree with you on that. Okay. But here's, okay. here's the thing. Yeah. You, this administration, and like I said before, previous administrations have not enforced the law. Absolutely. How do we do that? That's the answer that I think that I, we've come up with, and that's why I think we got so much support from Republicans. This is a Republican bill. I want to be very honest with, with, with folks. This is not the Senate bill that we, we came up with. But we, that was the question that we got over and over and over again. And that's the way that that's we were the able objection. to do it, is get this administration, the next administration, to enforce the law. Enforce the law. Thank you. That's the objection because we have tens of thousands of other than Mexicans coming across the border from communist countries, from terrorist countries, and only a small think, proportion of those you, get caught. Have, I'm done. I, I'm, I'm almost done. But don't call it reform if you're talking about allowing people who came here illegally to stay. Thank you. Next. Okay, and, and, you, and you've responded. Next, next question. Hi. Thanks for coming and thanks for having this. This is really great. My name is Sister Mary Wenlin and I volunteer at Tsukasa Ministry Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I've been doing this work probably since 1980. But um, I have two things. I think it's very important also for us to be authentic. The messaging is okay. <laughs> but when you talk to folks face to face, they want you to be authentic. Political talking is one thing. Talking from faith traditions, whether it's Catholic, Jewish, Muslim, is another thing. We need to be authentic. My other question is, I think something that's very important is the children of undocumented immigrants who were born here in our voting age, and there's a lot of them. And they are of the opinion that their parents' lives are being violated and they know what they stand for. And I think that's, to me, I remember when Latinos first started voting, we couldn't get them to the polls. <laughs> you know, they didn't know where they were. These kids know. They speak English, they're not afraid, they know the system. I think that's a huge, huge population to look at because every year, how many thousands are able to vote? Thank you. So on this issue of getting to the polls and children born here and being much more 
ready and uh, 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 forceful in, in, in expressing their circumstances. Matt, what, do you have anything to say from your uh, polling on voter turnout? Obviously, looking back at the last election, Latino, for all that one can say about the potential and the numbers of Latino voters, the participation still is disappointing. Well, yeah, especially in the 2014 midterm. I mean, there's no and doubt that was certain. the, the, the but, lowest but presidential recorded. presidential years are different. So yeah, and we, we see higher presidential, presidential years. Year. So one of the things that structures Latino turnout is this younger population, and I think the, the question is exactly right on target. We're starting to see that change. We're starting to see um, more political interest in the in the younger populations exactly surrounding the immigration issue. As I mentioned in, in the talk, 64% of Latino voters uh, say they're personally acquainted with an undocumented immigrant, and for a highest percentage of those folks say it's their parents. So that these folks are, are showing up and showing up more. But just in terms of looking at that sort of low turnout and saying, when are Latinos going to start voting at higher rates? Um, you know, our median age is 28. So half of our entire population is under the age of 28. Um, and across every racial group, it's extremely difficult to get people under the age of 28 registered in voting. Um, extremely difficult. So the fact that we have half of our population down there, it makes it look like Latinos are not voting at high rates. But once you adjust for age, um, there's not that big of a gap between Latino turnout rates and black and white turnout rates among registered voters. And so that's the big challenge is how can we um, increase political activism and interest among that younger population? And I think that the, the comment is, is right on track, that that's a place that we're at least seeing in polls and focus groups that people are mentioning that as an issue. Why, what brought them out was they were sort of inspired and, and personally connected to this immigration issue. Yeah, it's a very interesting point, median age of, of, of 28. I believe I'm correct that the median age of the American voter in general is 42. So that's a, a you know, that tells you Quite a, a bit younger, yeah. yeah well, you just a, a quick note on the younger folk. Um, the, these are the, the dreamers, particularly the ones who, who, who really pushed the administration to implement the DACA. Um, having interviewed many of them and talked to them and know them, uh, what I think is fascinating about them is that they are very clear that their vote is up for grabs. They are not wed to the Democratic Party. And um, so if a, if a Democrat isn't willing to offer them what they need, they are more than happy to turn to a Republican. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and which I think is true more generally in the in young in the yeah. younger population and comes with the millennial characteristics, etc. Uh, any anything further you would like to add to? No. Okay. Well, we're right on time. I'm extraordinarily. Um, um, grateful to all of you for joining in this conversation. I think we've, I hope, brought out a lot of points. And uh, on the issue of being authentic, I, I do, I do want to say here that we had this conversation about politics and we start off this conference with politics so fully simply because politics really is the issue at this point mm. where immigration is concerned. If policy was the issue, we would be talking about policy and we will be talking about policy the rest of the conference. So um, I don't want to be misunderstood that we're just trying to politicize and message an issue. In fact, that those are the those are the real barriers and, and um, difficulties that we face right now on the policy front. Thank you all so much. And um, we're going to take a break now.